life? That's a really loaded question. Meaning of life? Yeah. Meaning of life? Yeah, I yeah. have really no idea. This is tricky. Call me off guard at one minute, Keith. I mean, a lot of things in life, but if I want to go religion or spiritual, meaning of life to me would probably be happiness, most important. Happiness, to have happiness. Be happy. The pursuit of happiness. Passion. You live for, you live for your passion. Connection. Uh, relationships and um, empowering your dreams, living out your dreams. Смысл жизни, я думаю, что в жизни, в жизни самой. Meaning of life doesn't mean anything. The meaning of life to reproduce, to enjoy every second that we are here in this world because that's all we have. Not to let the demons f you up. Leading your life with along with Jesus Christ and obeying God's word. Ça qui importe pour la vie, c'est la vie éternelle. You have not left the world in worse state than when you arrived on it. So you have to somehow do something meaningful, whatever that is. I don't want to do anything with my life, but I have to do things with my life. Uh, having your loved ones and being happy. Just, you know, be a good person, kind of try to live life to the best that you can. We all have a purpose that God put us together here on this planet to serve some greater purpose for him. Living without any regrets and making sure that you live your life to the fullest. The meaning of life is to help others. Intentar pasar por la vida de la manera más desapercibida posible. Intentar ser lo más humilde con la naturaleza que pueda. You know, sometimes I think that we don't have any purpose in life. We are just here like another species. You are here just to enjoy like the landscape that every day that you live and you breathe. You have a lot of machines. You made you what you are for is him. Yeah. He made you for him. You spend your life discovering the meaning of life, I feel like. Everyone has their own meaning for life. I think it's something that comes with time and uh, I'm not sure yet. I'm still trying to find the meaning of life, I suppose. What is the meaning of life? Today we're going to start a new series called Explore God, and I'm so happy that you joined us today. If you need a Bible, would you please raise your hand? We're going to be in the book of Ecclesiastes, the book of Ecclesiastes. It's one of the poetic books of the Old Testament. You can go ahead and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 1, or you can take out your phone or your tablet device, and we're going to talk about today some questions that all of us ask. And over the next seven weeks, both on Sunday mornings and also in our small groups, we're going to be talking about Explore God, and we're going to be asking and reviewing the big questions of life. So if you can, turn to Ecclesiastes 1, and as you do that, go ahead and open your bulletin to today's message. So let's start off by answering a couple of questions, and these are questions that many people ask in their journey through life. Here's the first one. What is the meaning of life? The second one is, why are we here? And the third one is, what is our purpose? So what is the meaning of life? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? You already saw in the video that we just watched, some said, well, the meaning of life is to be happy, right? Everything is about being happy. The other person said, well, it's to live a life of no no regrets. I want to be able to live and look back and not be regretful or sorrowful for anything. Others might say, well, really the meaning of life is to make a lot of money. Make as much as you can, as fast as you can. Others say, well, everyone has their own meaning. Everyone has their own definition. Everyone really has their own purpose. And some who are brutally honest say, you know, I'm really not sure yet. I'm not sure what the meaning of life is. I've often thought about it, but I'm not entirely Sure. So here's a question I have for you. When in your life did you start asking the question, what is life all about? I remember growing up when I was a young dude about 40 years ago, and my friends were typically all older than I. I was the young one in the group, so of course they'd, they'd pick on me. 
And, you know, we would do our activities throughout the day. We would play baseball, football. We would go and ride bikes. You know, we would do a lot of things. And I remember oftentimes, well, my dad had this one rule. And the rule was you have to be home before the lights turned on, the street lights. And if not, then either the belt or the avocado tree was going to wait for you. And I remember on at least one occasion looking up at this light that had yet to turn on and wonder, what is life really about? And I was a kid, and at that time, my, my parents, we weren't really in church. But I remember thinking, you know, what is this about? I mean, all my friends and I did was, you know, play baseball, play football, go fishing, chase girls. They were successful. I was not. And, you know, all this stuff. But what was life really about? And I remember at a young age, I would ask that question, and none of my friends really had answers. I mean, I didn't really have answers to those, those questions. But when was the time in your life that you asked those questions? What is my purpose? What am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? I don't know about you, but have you ever felt like your life is like a machine? What do I mean? Well, what I mean is you're doing the same repetitive things over and over and over again. You get up at the same time every day. You eat the same cereal every morning. You leave for work at the same time. You arrive at work at the same time. You read the same articles online or, or newspaper, if you still get that. You have lunch at the same time every day. You leave your work at the same time every day. You get home more or less at the same time. You eat dinner at the same time. And then you do that five, sometimes six days a week. And it can feel like our life is on cruise control. And during those times, and I know it's happened on many occasions to people that I know, but life seems to be repetitive. We feel like we're just going through the motions, but we're not really getting anything out of it. And very honest people, very sincere people are asking, is this all that there is about life? I mean, over and over again, you, you hear professional athletes say they've, they've won the championship this afternoon. Somebody's going to win the Super Bowl. And, and at times, you'll hear one person say, is this it? Is that it? I mean, I, I've won it all. I'm the most valuable player. And, and is this all that there is? Well, we believe that there are really good questions that life forces us to ask. And we want to be a church where you can come and ask those questions. I remember a very popular radio personality would say, the only dumb question is the one you don't ask. You ever heard that before? But here's something that I think some of us can relate to. Look at this quote. It's here in your notes. H.D. Thoreau says, he's a philosopher. <clears throat> he said, most people live lives of quiet desperation. Can you identify with that? You might smile on the outside, but on the inside, you're not smiling. You may be laughing, and, and people say, hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. I'm all good. It's fine. No, I'm really doing well. But in the inside, you're, you're about to burst. You're about to cry. You're, you're so frustrated, but you're just going through the motions. You're asking the why question. You're, you're not sure why this difficulty has entered into your life. Or maybe you're here today and you say, you know, Marcel, that question, those questions have never really crossed my mind, if I could just be brutally honest. I've never really thought about life's purpose. I've never really thought about life's meaning. I've never really thought about why am I here to start with. But then something happens in your life with somebody you know, love, and care about, and it happens to all of us. You get a phone call. It's sudden. It's unexpected. It's on a Sunday evening or early Monday morning. And say, hey, they're in the hospital. Oh, okay, is everything all right? Well, no, they're in ICU. As a matter of fact, I think you need to go, like, right now. And all of a sudden, those questions that maybe we haven't considered, maybe we haven't pondered, all of a sudden, these questions come back because they remind us of our mortality. They remind us that in a second of time, life can change. And then we start asking the real questions of life. Or maybe we go to the doctor and they say, you have this 
disease or this condition, and it's not going to go away. It's treatable to some extent. But the reality is you're going to have to live with it for the rest of your life. And sometimes we get that unexpected call or visit. And somebody has passed away that we know, that we love. And during these times, we will ask these questions. Remember at the start of the year, we ask everybody to pray how many minutes a day? 20 minutes a day in one of four prayer blocks. We, we challenge you, please begin praying for 20 minutes a day. For people who need a spiritual wake-up, those who are far from God, those who don't know Christ as their Savior, or those who do know Christ, but they've walked away from church and, and their life is not reflecting Christ. Inevitably, during that time from, you know, the beginning of January till today, some of you have had to make hospital visits. Some of you have had to see people or pray for people that have gone through a difficult time. And if we could be honest, we get upset with God. We get angry at God because, you know, it's just not fair. They're so young. They're good people. They, they never try to hurt anybody. But here they are today in this situation. As a pastor, Russell and I, we, we were asked different occasions to take part in a wedding or maybe a funeral service. And, you know, weddings are beautiful, aren't they? You know, when you go to a wedding, everyone is so excited. They're, they're so giddy, right? They, they come to the wedding, and nowadays, you know, everyone has a smartphone. So they begin taking pictures of the, the building around, of the flowers, uh, of the little details, and everyone is focused on, on the bride as she comes in, on, on the groom as he's looking at the bride. And you know what I notice? Many times they're not focused on what's being said at the wedding because they're so distracted by the beauty of the bride and the moment, and, and they're trying to post something to social media quickly, and, and they're just trying to be in the moment, and they're not always listening to, to the message that a pastor may give. But what I also found very interesting is every time I'm given the opportunity to speak at a funeral, it amazes me the attention span of the people present. They're not checking their messages. They're not worried about what's on social media. They are in the presence of someone that they cared about. They, they're in the presence of, of family and friends and they are listening to whatever is being said for the most part. And all of a sudden, they come face to face with reality. I remember a couple of months back, and, and most of you know I used to work for UPS many years ago, and there was a driver who was shot and killed. And I went to the burial, and I saw some old friends there, and we talked. And they had a tent. It wasn't very big. It was very hot. There were a ton of people there packed in as close as they can get because they wanted to hear the very words that came out of the brother, the dad, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. When we are faced with mortality, if we haven't asked that question before, what is life about? Why am I here? What's my purpose? There's a strong chance that in those moments, you will ask those questions. So we want you to know as a church, it's okay to ask those questions. It's okay to ask those questions in your life groups this week as we start moving in this direction. It's okay to ask those questions because we want you to understand that God has an answer for the big questions of life. So in your notes, here's a statement that we're going to start off with. It's very simple but it's very powerful. We were created, you were created, to make God famous by fulfilling God's purposes. You were created to make God famous by fulfilling God's purposes. This is so foundational. This is one of those things where we, we have to look at the big picture and say, why did God place me on this earth? And some people say, well, I think he placed me here so I could be famous. No. 
He placed us here so that we, by the way that we live, can make God famous. Notice this point below. Knowing the purpose of life gives you direction for life. If I understand that the reason I am here is to magnify God's name through my life, to bring glory to God through the way that I live, to make him famous by what I do, what I say, where I go, how I act, what decisions I make, then he will show me the direction I need to go. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody and they said, I've decided to take some time to find myself? You ever had that conversation? Now, I'm not knocking that question or that statement. But I think what happens is we forget we don't find ourselves in ourselves. We find ourselves outside of ourselves. We find ourselves in God and God alone. Knowing the purpose of life gives you direction for life. Look at the next point. Your life was designed to make an eternal difference. All of us want to make a difference. We want to make a difference in our family. We want to make a difference with our children. We want to make a difference in the things that we study, in the work that we do. So we want our lives to matter. We want our, our marriage to matter. We want our relationships to matter. These are the things that God has put in our heart. So let's get to the main scripture as we start today. Isaiah 43, 7. It's here in your bulletin. The prophet Isaiah says, and I'd like you to circle this first word, everyone, everyone, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Would you please underline the phrase, I created for my glory. You see, the reason you have value is because you were created by God for God. You have infinite value because God was personally responsible in your creation. You and I are here today because God wanted us to be here. We are breathing today. We are living today because God ordained this even before you and I took our very first breath. But I want you to notice how personal this is. He says, I created for my glory whom I formed and made. So if you have ever heard this, and, and some of us have, you are worth nothing. You should have never been born. You have no value. You're never going to be anything. I want you to know they are wrong. They're wrong. Because you were created by God for God's glory and His purposes. Don't ever let anyone ever tell you that. When they say that, just look them right back in the eye. He says, you know what? I was created by God for God's purposes. And although what you are saying hurts, that is not the truth. You were created by God. Now notice the next point. So what is the purpose then? To glorify God with our lives. This is simple. This is not difficult. We didn't you know, put this together this morning to, to confuse you, to make it... No, no, this is very, very simple. I find my purpose in the one who created me. I find my purpose in the one who died for me. I find my purpose as I live for God's glory, not for my glory. That's how we find our purpose. God has given us gifts, abilities, and skills to magnify his name by serving others. That's what God has done. So even the gifts that you have, some of you are really, really good at singing. You are excellent at singing. Some of you are excellent at singing in the shower when no one else is around. And I join you in that excellency. 
But God has given us gifts. He's given us talents. He's given us desires and skills that we develop. And all of this is not just for our personal pleasure. If you are good in your business, it's for God's glory. If you are good as an investor and you know how to make money, it's for God's glory and God's purposes. If you are good at teaching children, it's for God's glory and God's purposes. If you are athletic and you can slam dunk, it's for God's glory and for God's purposes. You were created to make God famous. But sometimes we forget that the things that we have will make God famous as we serve others. Pay attention to this next video. Did you know walking is an Olympic sport? Like you walk, just walking. Apparently I've been training for the Olympics my entire life. I didn't even know it. Like I'm just, you just walk. How do you even get excited about walking? Like, man, did you see what he did? He had his left foot down. Didn't put his right foot in front of it. That stuff was awesome. He's amazing. The Bible always says that laughter is good like a medicine. People would always quote that to me. I've seen it, I don't know how many times. And then one day God said to me, if it's a medicine, why don't you take it to the sick? That is one of the hugest revelations that I've had since being a Christian. Because I've done comedy for years now. I've been on all of the late night TV shows. I've had a great time. But it wasn't until I made a shift from getting laughs from people to giving them an opportunity to laugh where everything changed because now this gift that I have it's not about me getting it's about me giving to others I did a show in Montrose Colorado a place called the Dolphin House now the reason it's called the Dolphin House is because um, they take care of abused children uh, dolphins whenever a dolphin gets hurt um, other dolphins swim around it to protect it so uh, until it's until it's better they take care of children who are being abused by their parents who are on drugs. And I walk in there, and I get the stories of these kids. And um, this grandmother tells me about her grandson, who is so afraid of his mom, like everywhere he goes, he wears a Spider-Man costume, like everywhere he goes. One of the things his mom has been doing to him is she's been pulling out his toenails. So I hear this little boy's story. Then I hear all these other kids' stories, too. Um, and then they bring them all in so I can do jokes for them and their caregivers. Now, listen, if, I, if, if it had not been for a God changing my mindset about comedy to giving people an opportunity to laugh versus getting laughter, I'm telling you, there is no way I would have been able to do the show. I've, I'd actually become physically sick after a while because we, this thing had been going on. So not only am I physically sick, but I'm down and low, and I'm hearing these stories. But I have to do the show because these kids need to laugh. So I go up on stage, and sitting right up front is Spider-Man in full costume. He's sitting on his grandmother's lap, and he's, and he's clenching her with his back to me. And I get up on stage, and I start doing jokes. Slowly but surely, people start laughing. About 20 minutes in it, people are laughing pretty well. And then I hear a voice, and the voice says, my name is Ronan. And um, this little boy pulls off his mask. He just, he like pulls off his mask, and he introduces himself to me. And the whole place is like frozen, sitting still, like in shock. He pulls off his mask, and he introduces himself to me as to say, here I am. This is my name. He's in a room where everyone's laughing. There's no telling if he had ever been in a room like that before. And suddenly he felt free enough to take off his mask. And um, I can't help but think every time I do a show, whether it be late night TV, whether it be at a church or wherever, that there's probably somebody in the room on some level that could be taken off their mask. It's not about me getting the last from them. It's about me showing up with my gift, being willing to 
to give it to the people. Because if I have a gift, my job is to present it to the people I feel like should have it. If they don't receive it, it doesn't matter. I've still done what I'm supposed to do. My job is to bring the funny fully and wholeheartedly because someone in that room um, needs to laugh, they're going through a hard time, or they need some sort of revelation that may come about because I've opened up the room with laughter. So that's my assignment. That's what I'm about. That's what I want to do. That's why I love to bring the funny. You should never argue with your wife, because if you win, you are married to a loser. <laughs> that's so funny. That is awesome. How, how many of you are, are just naturally funny? You're just naturally funny. Did you know you can use your gift to share God's love? You know, the first girl that laughed at my jokes, I married her, you know, because my jokes were not funny. But, but isn't it amazing that we often overlook the simple things that God has given us to be used for God's fame? I mean, I love that story because we often forget that the abilities that God gives us is ultimately for his glory. It's ultimately for his good. You know, I've said this many times. If, if you are in school, then be the, the best student that you can be. You know, don't slack off. Be the best student that you can be. If you're in the, in the military, be the best soldier that you can be. You know, if you are in the workplace, be the best worker, employee, supervisor, boss, business owner. Because this is what God wants to use to spread his fame. We don't have enough of that, and honestly, we need more. Now, let's take a look in your Bible, Ecclesiastes 1. Ecclesiastes 1, this is a short verse, verse 2. Ecclesiastes 1, verse 2. This is King Solomon. King Solomon was given the reign over Israel, and he had a real serious concern. He was a young guy. He didn't have wisdom and understanding like his father did. And he said, Lord, I need understanding. I need wisdom to lead your people. God not only, you know, gave them wisdom and understanding, but he gave them treasures and riches and more. So Solomon lived life to the fullest. But look at verse 2 of chapter 1. It says, Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Now look here in your notes. It says Solomon's introduction and eventual conclusion implies that riches, power, status, education, sex, adrenaline, knowledge, you name it, none of these things will give us meaning. Notice that word. None of these things will give us meaning. So he had it all. He did it all. He experienced it all. But he simply said it was vanity. It wasn't enough. It simply wasn't enough. You see, the purpose and meaning of life is not found in life. It is found in God. It is found in God. So this pursuit, and we've all done this. We've looked for other things. We've looked to satisfy ourselves. And it just simply runs out of steam. It's never enough. You always want more. It's simply not sustainable. So the purpose and the meaning of life is found in life. It is not found in life, rather. It is found in God. And, and notice this last point here. It says, Many pursuits bring temporary satisfaction, but do not define life's purpose. I mean, we've talked about this before. You know, most of us here enjoy eating. What's the problem with eating? In about four hours, if you're a teenager, in about 45 minutes, what? You're hungry again. So it's a temporal satisfaction. It's going to come again and again and again. Now, let's take a look at Ecclesiastes 1, verse 16. So scroll down a little bit. Verse 16. King Solomon speaking, he says the following. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. Verse 17. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. In other words, he studied everything. I perceived that this also is but striving after the wind. For in much wisdom is much vexation or aggravation. And he who increases knowledge 
increases sorrow. So notice what he says. Acquiring more knowledge and understanding is still not enough. How many of you here read one book a month? Let me see your hands. One book a month. Okay, great. How many of you read one book every six months? More or less. How many of you read one book a year? Okay. How many of you are working on one book a lifetime? All right. Okay. At least, you know, you've got some goals, right? One book a lifetime. Now, I love studying. I love reading. You know, throughout the day, I'm listening to different podcasts, webinars. You know, I'm a conference junkie. You know, if there's a conference close by, I'll probably sign up and go. But I want to encourage you today in your acquisition of knowledge. Okay, here it is. It's in verse 18. He who increases knowledge increases sorrow. So be encouraged. What does this tell us? The more that you know, the more that you learn, the more that you realize what? You don't know. There's a lot that I don't know. And the more I read, the more I study, the more I realize, wow, there's so much there that I don't know. But listen, you are never going to find your significance in knowledge alone, in understanding alone. It simply does not define who you are. Look at chapter 2, so flip over a page. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. Solomon said, verse 4, I made great works, I built houses, and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks, and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which no water the forest of growing trees, or from which to water the forest of growing trees. So Solomon says, great accomplishments, building homes, planting vineyards, all of these things will not define your significance. I do not have my, I do not have a green thumb. If you do, you know, congratulations. So I can plant a tree, and some time ago I planted an avocado tree in my yard. I dug a hole, I watered it, and I put a little bit of, you know, nutrients in there. After a time, that nice, beautiful, luscious green tree started turning yellow. So I bought some more vitamins and minerals. I put it there. But then slowly and without announcing, my, my neighbor, she's an elderly lady, without telling me, she went, you know, I don't have a fence that divides our yard, just some bushes. So she went around the bushes, and she started watering my tree more frequently. She started trimming and pruning some of the branches and giving it the nutrients it needed. So every time she would see me, she would say, your tree is looking so nice. And I look at her and go, yes, thank you for your love and your care. But I am really bad of taking care of trees. I can buy them, I could plant them, but then I need help. Listen, it doesn't matter if you have a beautiful garden. It doesn't matter if you remodel your house at an additional 1,000 square feet. That is good, but it will never be enough. You might be super educated, and that's great, but education alone is not enough. It doesn't define your significance. You may be the hardest worker. You may have risen to the top ranks in your company. You may be the president of your company. And that's good. And we should use that for God's fame. But it will never deeply satisfy you to the point of significance. So as you're here today, I want you to think about these things. Why am I here? What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose that God has for me? Already we've said our purpose is to make who famous? God famous. It's to glorify God with our lives. Now look at verse 8. Just when you thought Solomon had enough, no, he had more. Verse 8 says, I also gathered for myself silver and gold and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the sons of men. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, notice the statement, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil. And this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered, 
all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and striving after the wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Now, unlike you and I, Solomon would just sit in his royal chair and people from all over the world would come and hear his wisdom. But it was expected that before you would hear the wisdom of King Solomon, you would have to deposit gold and perfume and silver and all kinds of artifacts. And this guy was beyond filthy rich. Whatever he wanted, he got. If he wanted to hire a choir one day for his personal pleasure, he hired a choir. If he wanted to eat steak, he ate steak. If he wanted to eat chicken, he ate chicken. If he wanted to eat vegan, he ate vegan. Whatever he wanted, he got. All of this, he said, was pure vanity. Now, Ecclesiastes 5. Turn over three chapters. Ecclesiastes 5.10. It's a short verse. He writes, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. So this is a guy that has more money than you and I combined times a hundred, probably, and more. And he said, listen, you're never going to be satisfied with money. You're always going to want more. It's never going to be enough. No matter how many times you receive treasure, no matter how many times you shop here and you buy this, it will simply not be enough. It's not who you are. It's not your purpose. It doesn't give you meaning. So notice this next statement, and I think all of us can identify with this. We have all pursued one thing or another. All of us have pursued one thing or another, in hopes of finding more satisfaction. We've all been there. We've all pursued one thing or another in hopes of finding more satisfaction or a greater purpose for living. Well, if I just do this, then I'll be more significant. If I just do this, I'll feel better about myself. If I give this, then... And it still falls short. Some of us, it says have done very well in our pursuits. But our life's purpose remains a mystery. Isn't that amazing? You can be successful in how you define success and still not know why you exist. You can live on Star Island. You can have several yachts. You can be the top person who's followed in Twitter or Instagram or something else and still not know why you are here. We are here to make God famous. So what was Solomon's conclusion? Because we have to ask that question. What did he conclude with all of this? Now, I know what some of you are thinking. Marcel, if God gave me all the riches and treasures and gold and all that stuff, I'll be glad to give him a summary of my findings. But notice what he said. Ecclesiastes 12.1. It's in your bulletin. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Now, how many of you here are youth? How many of you feel youthful? All right. Some of us feel youthful. We may not be youth, but we feel youthful. And he says, remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, of which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. So here's what Solomon is saying. Pursue God today. Not next week, not next year. Don't start in three years. Start pursuing God today while you have strength to live. Does that make sense? If there's one thing you don't want to procrastinate, it's pursuing God and understanding why in the world did he put you here. Don't wait. There's a bigger purpose. 
Ecclesiastes 12, 7. You can turn there. And this is a sobering thought. And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. And then in verse 13, that one's in your bulletin. He says, the end of the matter. This is it. This is the end of the matter. All has been heard. Here's his conclusion. Fear God and keep his commandments. Would you underline that phrase in your bulletin? Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. So here is Solomon's conclusion. Life is meaningless without God. That's the bottom line. Life is meaningless without God. If God is not in your life, then there's no purpose for living. But God gives everything meaning. Life is meaningless without God. But God gives everything meaning. If you look back in your history books at some of the world dictators that we've had, some of them decided to get everyone who was mentally or physically handicapped, special needs, and kill them all. Why would somebody do something like that? Because there's no fear of God in them. It doesn't matter if a person is missing a limb. It doesn't matter if they can't speak as eloquently as you can. It doesn't matter if they can't process things at the same speed as you. It doesn't matter if there are things they will never figure out. They have infinite value in God's eyes. And every person can find meaning when they find their meaning in God. And you know what happens to us when we realize that life is meaningless without God, but God gives everything meaning? We start loving people the way God wants us to love them. Doesn't matter what they look like. Doesn't matter their ethnicity. Doesn't matter. What matters is that God created them. Unique. He loves them, and we are to love them too. Now, Ecclesiastes 3. So if you want to flip back a little bit. Ecclesiastes 3. So now we're, we're getting to the heart of the matter. In Ecc Ecclesiastes 3.10. And by the way, if you want to go through this this week and listen to it on your podcast, I definitely encourage you to do that on your Bible app. It's a great book. Solomon says in verse 10, I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. You know, he's seen it all. He has made everything beautiful in its time. And notice this next phrase. Also, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. Every single person, whether they follow God whether they reject God or whether they're searching for God. Every person has a spiritual void in their life created by God deep within their spirit, deep within their soul. There's a spiritual void. It's a desire for the eternal into the heart of every person. God placed it there Nobody can move it out of the way. You can't unbelieve it out of the way. You know, it's there by God's design. And only God can fill that void. And some of us, as we've said before, we try to fill this void with other things, and we look back and we realize none of this satisfies. None of this brings me pleasure over and it's not sustainable 
God wired us that way intentionally. Our desire for eternal life is fulfilled through a growing relationship with Jesus. So God gives us this void. This void is in the, in the being of every one of us. It's something deep within our spirits. And with that in mind, look at 1 John 5 in your bulletin. John says, and this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life. So God extends this eternal life. He offers it to people. And he says, and this life is in who? In his son. This life is in his son. It's not something that you can buy. It's not something that you own. It's not a property. It's a person. It's the son of God. Look at verse 12. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. So God creates a void. We all have had it. Who's the one that fills the void? It's Jesus. This was ordained by God. So as we tell people, listen, God loves you and he wants to have a relationship with you. For some, that's too big a concept to, to understand. And, and we quote, you know, passages, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him would not what? Would not perish, but have what? Eternal life. Translation, the void is no more. There's no void. It is filled with the Son of God. But we all know that because of our sin, our sin separates us from God. Our sin moves us away, forces us to hide, forces up us to make excuses. We call it mistakes. We call it whatever we want to call it. And that sin separates us from God. But the good news is that Jesus came and he died on the cross for our sins. He came and he lived among men, among women. He was born of a virgin. He lived without sin. And then eventually he went to the cross. He died on the cross. He shed his blood for you and for me. He was buried. And on the third day, what happened? He rose from the grave. Now, look at 1 John 5.11 again. And this is a testimony that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Present tense today. If you don't have the Son, the void continues. The void continues. So if you're here today, and you say, you know, I'm not sure I understand all of this exactly, but I, I do have questions. And we're glad that you have questions. We're here to help. In our life groups this week, we, we encourage you, join the life group. We're starting this series in our life groups. You have questions. God has answers. And we want to help. Now, what was Jesus' challenge? What was the challenge that Jesus gave those who were listening as he delivered the Sermon on the Mount? Here it is. Jesus challenges people. He challenges you. He challenges me to seek first God's kingdom, saying that then the rest of life will have meaning and purpose as they experience God's provision. Jesus is saying, you put God first, and we're going to read this in a minute. You put God first, you will understand the rest. You put God first, then God will provide for the rest. You put God first, and you won't have to worry. You put God first, and you will make God famous. Matthew 6, well-known passage Starting on verse 25, it's going to be up here in the screen. So I want you to think about this setting. Here's Jesus, and he's kind of halfway through 
his, his Sermon on the Mount. He's talking to people, and they are just listening attentively. Because what he says here in the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, it applies to all of us today. Notice what he says. He says, therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value than they? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to the span of life? And why are you so anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Verse 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So he says to those that were listening, I want you to seek first God's kingdom, God's will, God's rule, God's presence. I want you to submit your life to the ways of God. That's what's going to make a difference. That's what's going to make God famous. Not your way, not my way, not our way. So I want you to think this morning for just a minute as we bring the message to a close. I'd like you to think about your personal life. Not everybody else for a minute, just, just about your own personal life. What would happen in your personal life if starting today, moving forward, there was no question at all that every decision, every plan, every word would be filtered through making God famous through your life? Before you take that decision, before you accept that new job, before you even apply to this other job, before you apply for this school, you ask the question, Lord, is this what you want? Is this going to make you famous, or is this really about what I want? What would happen in your life if you asked the question, am I putting God first in this decision? What would change in your family this week, this year, if you said, you know, this year, we're going to put God first in our family. We're going to do things differently. We're not going to just, you know, follow whatever we feel like doing. We're going to do things differently. We're going to ask God to show us. And then we're going to put God first in the way that we plan our schedules. What would happen if in your job, when you got to work tomorrow, when you got to school tomorrow, you would ask the question, how can I make God famous through my work? through my studies, through the way that I interact with students, through the way that I interact with people that I work with? How could I make God famous? In your finances, what would change this year if you said, you know, I'm going to put God first in my finances. No more excuses. I'm going to put him first. Here's what I'm going to do. Remember what we said earlier. Life is meaningless without God. But with God, he gives everything meaning. So as we wrap this up, I want to leave you with one final thought. Here it is. We find life's purpose when we prioritize God first in our lives. We find life's purpose when we prioritize God first in our lives.
Would you join me in a moment of reflection and prayer as we consider these things? Lord, I think most, if not all of us here, have asked one of three or maybe all three of these questions. Why am I here? What is my purpose? What is the meaning of life? And Lord, I know we can get really technical and, and complicate the matter, but it's actually very simple, as you tell us in the book of Isaiah. You want your name to be magnified, to be glorified. You want your name to be famous among the earth. And Lord, that's our job. We know that there are distractions. We know we have pursued other things. But Lord, I pray that today we would hit the reset button and say, you know, today I'm going to begin asking the question. How can this action, how can this decision, how can this thought, how can this activity, how can this conversation bring glory to God and make his name famous? Lord, forgive me, forgive us, when we focus primarily on ourselves to get attention, to get our way. Lord, forgive us for that. And Lord, I pray for those who have questions today. I pray for those who do not know you as Savior and Lord. And Lord, they're still here and they have the void that you have placed unfulfilled. I pray, Lord, that this morning they would not delay, but that they would turn to you with all their hearts. If you're here today and you've identified with that void that remains empty, you know that God has been seeking you. You know he's been getting your attention. Why not right there where you are, just ask God in a prayer like this, just say, Lord, I, I recognize today that I'm a sinner. Lord, I don't understand all of these things, but I know that I have sinned against you. Forgive me for my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ died for my sins. <clears throat> Lord, I pray that you would make me a new person. Give me a new heart. Give me a new start. I pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're here today.